Um, in your in your next book, in your uh, Reckless Disregard, you kind of look a little bit more widely at, at Democrats in general and uh, the presidents, uh, Democrat presidents and their positions on things like war. Could you tell our uh, listeners a little bit about that book? Sure. Uh, yeah, Paul. You know, actually, I was born into a Southern Democratic family in North Carolina. I'm from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I was born into a, a Southern Democratic uh, family and was raised to be a FDR and JFK kind of uh, Democrat. Mm-hmm. And I realized during my time in the military and during my time in the Clinton administration that what has happened to uh, the Democratic Party uh, is it, sad. It's tragic. And I think what, what has happened to the Democratic Party um, over over the last uh, three or four decades is that we've had, we've had a great party who at one time was very strong, pro-military, pro-national security, pro-defense. I mean, look at look at FDR and Truman in, in terms of their anti-communism approaches. And, and right. you know, of course, uh, I think what happened was to the Democratic Party was the Vietnam War mm-hmm. and the uh, anti-war movement of the 1960s. And since then, if you look at the record, since 1968, 1972, since George McGovern, we, the Democratic the Democrats have given us two presidents, Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, <laughs> arguably the two worst commanders in chiefs in our in our in our nation's history. Yeah, and and I have as an Air Force 20 year Air Force pilot veteran, I can tell you that I came in post Jimmy Carter uh, during Ronald Reagan. I switched my allegiance during, during Ronald Le- Reagan. I served President Bill Clinton by his side for two years, and, I, and I've seen the transformation and what happens to a, a military, to a nation, when we elect the wrong people to be our commanders. And I think that that's what happened to the Democratic Party in the 1960s. The, the Democrats of today are the, the, the children of the 1960s. You've got Bill yes. Clinton and, and Hillary Clinton, who were anti-war, anti-establishment uh, types back in the 1960s. Right. Uh, their peers are anti-establishment, anti- anti-war types, and I think you're seeing Barack Obama today is is the uh, is the fruit of, of their labors. I think you're seeing a party, the Democrats, who are totally out of touch with the military, uh, who do not, do not understand what it means to serve the, in the, the nation in terms of uh, combat, in terms of selfless service. And I think that we have in this country today a very polarized divide. We have the Republican Party, which I am now a member of, very proudly, who uh, who recognizes what it means to serve in the military, and you have the Democrats who are anti-military, almost to a, to a degree anti-American. Yeah. And I say that, biting my lip, but I do believe that's true in some cases. I mean, I think that that's the case when you look at college campuses today. When you look at um, uh, politicians like Barack Obama and his, certainly his wife and, and Hillary Clinton, and uh, you've got a, a very clear. Uh, delineation between the Democratic Party today and what used to be uh, the Democratic Party back in the 40s, 50s, early 60s. Absolutely. And and at times, I think that Democrats recognize they have this deficiency, that they have uh, weaknesses when it comes to putting up candidates that are going to uh, try to walk under the banner of being pro-military, being uh, tough on the issues that we have to face. And in 2004, uh, when this book, Reckless Disregard, came out, you know, the nation was looking at the presentation of John Kerry, where the Democrats were trying right. to say, here we have uh, a soldier, here we have a, a warrior we want to present on the other side. And that was not the case. And we had, as you just aptly said, a child of the 60s. We had a protester. And um, your book dealt with many of the deficiencies of of John Kerry. What are some of the deficiencies you could tell our folks a little bit that are in the book, Reckless Disregard? Well, John Kerry, I think, Paul, where John Kerry, um, you know, going back to his time in Vietnam, for example, John Kerry had a a, uh, 12-month deployment to Vietnam, which was cut short by nine months. He actually went over there for three months. That that in itself doesn't doesn't bother me. He got three Purple Hearts, which, which is a little bit dubious. That doesn't bother me either. But when you come back to the U.S. as, a, as, a, as a, an officer or a, a service member and you testify in uniform right? and you call your fellow, your peers, you call your, your compadres, you call your, your, you know, your fellow officers and your, and your NCOs and your enlisted uh, soldiers, uh, baby killers and, and you know, rapists and murderers, 
and you don't number one that's that's violating all kinds of ethics and, mm-hmm. and I think good integrity and also the UCMJ but number two he didn't have the moral authority to do that he assumed these things were true he didn't have first-hand knowledge of these things and that that to this day rubs Vietnam vets post Vietnam vets and me my dad was a it, it, my dad was a Vietnam era uh, Air Force pilot and he's to this day it detests John Kerry and detests Jane Fonda because he he considers I think and I think Raleigh so considers them to be traitors and I think that we've got we John Kerry created a whole new breed of politician I think he crossed the line back in those days wearing his uniform to Capitol Hill and, and, and declaring he was still in uniform he was still in the Navy and he declared wow. his fellow his, his fellow his peers to be murderers and rapists and, and committing all kinds of atrocities which he himself had never witnessed personally I think that crosses the line. Well, yeah, I think, absolutely. I think, I think today you're seeing the exact same thing. Well, I, I, I would say the exact same thing is happening when you have people like uh, John Murtha, mm-hmm. uh, a former Marine, who says that the Marines at Haditha were guilty of cold-blooded murder before the trial had ever started. And yep. you know that kind of thing results in Americans being killed, uh, and that crosses the line. And in my mind... Uh, again, this is one one man's opinion, but an Air Force vet. I think that crosses the line into treason. I think John Murtha at least owes those Marines, who have all been exonerated, by the way, uh, for their for the incident at Haditha yeah. and Iraq. Yeah. By the way, he, yeah. He owes them a resp- he owes them an apology. Number one, and and, and my I, I I would I would uh, plead for a censure. I mean, you cannot go. That's that's undue command influence. You cannot go forward to the press and say these Marines are guilty of something before the investigation had ever been started, and they had been exonerated, Paul. I mean, that's the kind of thing that's happening in this country today. That's, that's where the whole war crime, my, my latest book, War Crimes, is all about. We have the left in this country today prosecuting our soldiers in the court of public opinion, and that's not fair. Absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Buzz Patterson. His website is www.buzzpatterson.com, and you can get uh, his books there, which is a great outlet to get additional information. Uh, His books are also available at Amazon.com, and we have them linked for our listeners' convenience at our master website of Superior Conservative Values at www.ibbotsonusa.com. And I think you've touched on uh, uh, with your book war crimes as well that you know the military has a tremendous um responsibility they have a tremendous load that's laid upon them to go and and execute these operations to to meet their missions to stay alive and it's been amazing how the military has had this battle from the rear where democrats one by one have just attacked them from the floor of congress you know you talked about john murtha we have uh, statements from john Kerry as a, a political figure we have uh, dick durbin in his gulag statements and one after another after another of unfounded, unsubstantiated, uh, liable attacks on the military. And it's just amazing that this would be done any time. But in a time of war where the nation needs to have unity, where we need to have clarity of thought, where we need to push together as a nation, they are for political purposes uh, tearing us uh, apart and causing this divide. And I think books like what you've written uh, help expose that because I think a day of reckoning is coming for these politicians probably first in their political positions. I don't think people want to have politicians that want to take a war and use it for political gain well you're exactly right paul i I will uh, tell you listeners two things you know uh war crimes uh is a very angry book and i'll I'll tell you uh, i'm I'm very honest and forth forthright that it's a very angry book i've written and i think that of the three books is probably the, the best written um in terms of quality and quantity but i also think that it's the most important book that i've written so far uh, for two reasons. Number one, we as a nation voted to go to war in Iraq in 2002. The congressional authorization in October 2002 was a bipartisan support to go to war. Um, if you look at the, and I talk about this in war crimes, if you look at the fact that you know three fourths of the U.S. Senate and the U.S. Congress voted to authorize military action in, in Iraq, it was not based 
let me underscore that, was not based on WMDs being in Iraq. It was based on a myriad, there was 23 tenants uh, in the authorization to go to war in Iraq. Two dealt with weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. So 21 dealt with other reasons to go into Iraq. So, number one, we as a nation voted for the war in Iraq, and we sent our young men and women into war in Iraq in 2003. That was a, a, a national decree. That was not President Bush. That was not the Republican Congress or Republican Senate. It was the U.S. people, by 80% voted to go to war in Iraq.